Welcome back to the St. Paul Center for Biblical Theology. I'm Beckett, and here in the United States, we are celebrating Thanksgiving. Now, our readings today for Mass are a bit ironic because they're not necessarily a reason for giving thanks, or are they? In the book of Revelation, chapter 18, we hear about the destruction that comes at the apocalypse. And then in the gospel, Christ talks about the destruction of Jerusalem. And then at the end of the gospel, he talks about, at the, well, at the end of uh, the first reading, at the end, we hear a song of Alleluia about the triumph of God. And then at the end of the gospel, we hear about Christ coming on the clouds of heaven. So it's, on the one hand, talking about the destruction of worldly things, and on the other hand, talking about the coming of heavenly things. So at the outset, it might seem a bit frightening, sort of like when we approach the book of Revelation, the apocalypse. It might seem a bit frightening, but in the end, we have to remember that it's always about the wedding supper of the Lamb. It's always about giving thanks to the Lord for his great goodness, for his great glory, and for bringing us, making us a part of himself bringing us into his mystical body. I'd like to look at one of my favorite books, Dr. Scott Hahn's book, The Lamb's Supper. For a few verses, when he talk, uh, for a few paragraphs, when he talks about destruction that goes on in Revelation. And he says, first and foremost, that The details of the destruction described in Revelation correspond closely to the history of Jerusalem's destruction. In Revelation 17 through 19, John shows a city destroyed by fire. Jerusalem was entirely destroyed by fire, and he's talking about the destruction of Jerusalem around 70 AD. Dr. Hahn goes on to say that much later in the apocalypse, when the king of the earth, kings of the earth assemble for battle on the great day of the Almighty, they assemble on the hill of Megiddo, or Armageddon. This location recalls yet another painful historical memory for Israel. Armageddon was the place for disobeying the instruction of God's prophet. See Second Book of Kings. Josiah's defeat at Megiddo twists for the generation of Christians was, no, I'm sorry, uh, Josiah's defeat at Megiddo weakens Isra weakened Israel's defenses and left Jerusalem vulnerable to destruction by Babylon. An ironic twist for the generation of Christians was that Jesus Christ, like Hosea, a Davidic king and reformer who was cut down in his prime, would uh, uh, persevere in obedience and succeed where Josiah failed, establishing a new Jerusalem witnessed by the fall of the old. So we see that though there's destruction going on in the apocalypse, we're meant to understand it in the full spectrum of salvation history, both looking at what happened in the Old Testament and now seeing at how Christ kind of turns that on its head, that when we look at what goes on in the book of a revelation, that though we see destruction going on, even the destruction of Jerusalem in the gospel, it's not something to be afraid of. It's something that is meant to be understood in, in terms of fulfillment, in terms of wedding imagery. Dr. Hahn also goes on to say that the book of Revelation makes it clear that even though every believer must battle against powerful supernatural forces, no Christian ever fights alone. Till the end of time, Michael and the faithful angels fight on the side of the church. And this, Revelation shows us, is the side that wins. So we always have to look at the book of Revelation in terms of victory. Christ is the victor. And the question is, are we on his side? So as we move into today's gospel, Christ talks about the destruction of Jerusalem, but again, we have to look at that in terms of the ultimate victory of Christ at the apocalypse, at the end of time. It's not something to be afraid of. Even the destruction of our world right here, right now, going on all around us, we have to look at that in terms of our Christian faith 
in Christ's second coming. Our Christian faith in the apocalypse. And if you recall, what we've also talked about in Dr. Hahn's book, the word apocalypse, Apocalypse comes from, it is a wedding word. It comes from the word, the Greek word apocalypsis in the Old Testament. Uh, excuse me, in, in the, it's in the Septuagint, but it's also in uh, the book of Revelation. Uh, and apocalypsis, where we get the word apocalypse, comes from, it's a wedding word. It comes from wedding ceremonies. When the bride walks down the aisle, her face is covered. It's veiled. And what happens when she approaches her bridegroom, the bridegroom lifts the veil from the bride. And the act of lifting the veil from the, from the bride, the unveiling in Greek is apocalypse, apocalypsis. So the word apocalypse ultim ultimately means unveiling. It's the unveiling of the bride of Christ. It's the unveiling of who we are in union with Christ because we are a part of the mystical body of Christ, but we are also the bride of Christ in his church. When he comes in his second coming on the clouds, let's, let's jump ahead and let's see what St. Augustine uh, says about that. Um, he says that, quote, Then they will see the Son of Man coming in a cloud with great power and majesty. As I see it, this could be taken in one of two ways. One way is that he will come in the church as in a cloud. He continues to come in this way according to his word. Hereafter you will see the Son of Man sitting at the right hand of the power of God and coming in the clouds of heaven. He comes with great power and majesty because his great power and majesty will appear in the saints to whom he has given great power, so that persecution might not overcome them. The other way in which he will come will be in his body, in which he sits at the right hand of the Father. In this body he died, and rose again, and descended into heaven. It is written in the Acts of the Apostles, When he said these things, a cloud received him, and he was taken up from their sight. The angels then said, He shall come as you have seen him go away. We have reason to believe that he will come not only in the same body, but also in a cloud, since he will come as he left them, and the cloud received him as he went. So we have all this imagery going on in the Acts of the Apostles and today's Gospel in Luke um, about Christ going up to heaven and coming down from heaven on a cloud. But St. Augustine is also talking about uh, what is talked about in the book of Hebrews, a great cloud of witnesses. The saints, even you and I. St. Augustine talks about how he comes in great power and majesty because his great power and majesty will appear in his saints, to whom he has given that great power. And how is that great power manifested, St. Augustine says? So that persecution might not overcome them. He's not talking about the great power to, you know, split the Red Sea like Moses, not talking about the great power to cure people, not talking about great power to call down fire from heaven. No, he's talking about the great power it is to resist sin and temptation and doubt and fear. That is, the, is great power. All the sin we see in this world is a result of fear which in itself is sin. All the sin we see in the world is a result of despair, which in itself is a sin. Did, did you not realize that hopelessness, not having hope, is a sin? And we have to take that to confession. If you're not taking the sin of hopelessness, the sin of despair to confession, take it immediately. Because hopelessness leads to more sin. And the great power that Christ gives to us is the power to overcome temptation, the power to overcome sin. And St. Augustine suggests that perhaps, just perhaps, that the great cloud that Christ will return will be the cloud through, uh, uh, the great cloud of witnesses, talking about in the book of Hebrews. 
in the letter to the Hebrews, the great cloud of witnesses, you and I. And that great cloud is the mystical cloud of holiness, the mystical cloud of sanctity, the mystical cloud of resisting temptation, avoiding the near occasion of sin. St. Augustine suggests that perhaps, just perhaps, Christ will come again in the cloud of your virtue, in the mysticism of your virtue, of all of our virtues united together. So let's resist sin and temptation. And the more we resist it, the more Christ comes into the world, the great King revealing his glory. Thank you all for joining us once again on this reflection on the readings during Thanksgiving. I am thankful for you all being here. If you enjoyed this video, please like it and share it and subscribe to our YouTube channel. God bless you.